Hello everyone and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 108, which reads as follows. Yankinchi yitang vahutang valoke sangvacharang yajitha punya peko sabampi tang nachatu bhagameti abhivadana uju kate suseyo which means, it's actually a bit difficult because the grammar doesn't really work in English. So whatever, whatever sacrifice or um, worship there is in the world, if for 100 years, sangvat charang yajeta punya peko, one desiring punya, desiring merit, should perform such a sacrifice or such a worship, and yes, it's actually a very, very similar verse and story to, to the last two. Sabampitang chatubhagameti. It doesn't come to a quarter of the value. All of that doesn't come to a quarter of the value. The hundred years of sacrifice or worship that one pays. Abhivadana ujugate suseyo. For the greater... Uh, in comparison to the greater uh, abhivadana or, or respect or reverence that one pays to, and today our word is ujugatta, in regards to those who are ujugatta, gone to or become straight, those who have gained a rectitude, moral or ethical or mental uh, straightness, uprightness. Those who are upright. So, same story. We have Sariputta, uh, and it's it, it, it's becoming apparent that he was really uh, instrumental in helping a lot of his relatives and now his friends become enlightened. So now we have Sariputta's friend, Sahayaka Brahmana, a Brahmin who was a friend of Sariputta, friend of Sariputta is from before. And so Sariputta went to him and asked him, do you do any good deeds? And he says, oh yes, what, any, what do you do? Oh, I offer sacrificial slaughter. And of course Sariputta doesn't see that as being a wholesome deed. This is about the, really the crux of these three stories, is the idea that uh, Good deeds, the, the, our, our concept of good deeds is often quite misled. And this even occurs in Buddhism. You'll see Buddhists performing deeds that they think are good deeds, when in fact they are uh, perhaps uh, useless. You know? So the case of... I, I, I've told this story before, but once... Uh, we had uh, a katina ceremony where I was staying and all the villagers came together to do the katina ceremony and uh, so what they did is they had a, they had this this very important I was I was in the in a rural area so it was an area where people didn't have a lot of money and there was one man who had built a house in the area from Bangkok and he was quite rich and so he got his rich friends from Bangkok to come up and they put together a bunch of money and they put the money up on a tree and they brought this money tree to the monastery and they wanted to do a katina ceremony. Well, it turns out half of them were drunk. Uh, they had been drinking and uh, and the, funny, the, funny, the funniest part was, and what sort of made it a bit ridiculous, was that they didn't have a single robe. Uh, with which to do the katina. So they brought this money tree, thinking, well, that's katina. Katina is a money tree, because that's really what it's become. It's all about money trees. Trees that have are literally the, the made of money. The, the leaves are, are folded up bits of money, or just money sticking up on sticks. Um, and so I said, I said, okay, we're ready to do katina. What do we do? And I said, well, where's the robe? And and they didn't have a robe. So I said, oh, well, well, can we borrow one of yours? And I said, okay. And I, I took off, I actually took off 
Uh, anyway, I don't want to talk about it. I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, yeah, you know. Point being, not really what I would call a wholesome uh, engagement, especially considering the alcohol involved. And the fact that after it was all over, they took the money back and uh, some of the half of the gifts that were supposed to go to the monastery, they took back for the village. Uh, it was really... <laughs> Uh, it was a bit of a, uh, a system that they had set up and yeah, this happens in Buddhist circles sometimes where we lose sight of why are we doing this I think while we're doing it often they're doing it just because they, they're excited to have their um, village and their, their um, community grow so the money goes to the community I think or I don't know the stuff goes for the community um, and they don't realize the great benefit to actually giving a gift. And in fact, they don't really, they aren't really interested in giving gifts. On the other hand, there was that, that very same, mon same village um, ended up being quite uh, awesome about giving alms. They, <laughs> another funny aspect of being there, I was staying with an old monk, two old monks. So this was later when I was staying with a second old monk, but I was staying with a first old monk deeper in the forest. And uh, he told me, and when you go on, he said, uh, well, you can go on alms round to the village, but you won't get anything. You might get some, some dried noodles or, or canned fish, but that's about it. It won't be enough to eat, but you can go. And it was three and a half kilometers walk along a dirt gravel road that was actually somewhat painful to walk. Uh, but I did walk three and a half kilometers and often had to walk three and a half kilometers back, but not always. Sometimes someone going to the park, there was a national park near where the monastery was, uh, would give us a ride back or give me or eventually us when I had followers. Uh, but but it, the great thing, once I went and, and they could see that I was uh, interested in meditation and, and uh, wasn't some crabby old uh, monk. They uh, they were really keen on, and eventually the whole village began to give in, and they really got this sense of, of the greatness. People who, who I think had never really gotten into it, and there was one man who was a really devout Buddhist and very interested in the Dhamma and very knowledgeable about the Dhamma, and we used to talk about the Dhamma, and he was really impressed, and he's, you know, he said, you know, this is a great thing, that you know, people who I've never seen these people give before uh, are now into giving. So, so, so there was that. But that's really what's, what it's about. It's the difference, these this verses are about the difference between spiritual practices. We have this idea of spiritual practice in, in many Buddhist cultures of paying respect to gods or angels, and they've started making up angels. It's, they've taken, taken them from Hindu myths like Ganesha. People worship this, this monkey, uh, no, sorry, the elephant uh, god, and they have all these myths about Ganesha and, and Hanuman. In this same village, there was a woman who, who claimed to be a avatar, an avatar is a big thing in, in Thailand and yeah, in Thailand anyway, uh, an avatar for Hanuman. And of course Hanuman is, is this legend. It's, it's a story really. I mean there's no, there's no even there's not even any uh, ancient religious texts I think that have Hanuman in them. It's this tale of the Ramayana, which is a fairly modern tale. and yet in India as well they worship Hanuman or, or they seem to. they have monkeys monkey statues in, in front of their fields to ward away evil demons and stuff. Um, but yeah, these sort of things, not worth a quarter of the, as he says, n n not, a, not a fourth part. Not chattu bhagamiti, chattu bhagamiti. They don't come to a quarter, they don't even come to a thousandth part, as we were talking about in the earlier ones. Anyway, so he tells him this, it's a little bit different. Uh, he takes him. He, he says, "He says, look, you have to come to to see him, to see the teacher." And he takes him to the see the teacher. And this time, he actually says, "Bhante, please tell this man the way to the Brahma world." And the Buddha, but the Buddha says the same thing. The Buddha asks him what he does, and he says, "You could do that for a year, 
and yet it would be not be worth the smallest piece of offering. And and he, here he says something also a bit different. Um, Lokya mahajanasa dinadanang. So if you if you uh, were to give, if you were instead to give uh, to the great to the populace, you know, if you were instead to give to to poor people, for example, that would be uh, of, that was one thing would be of greater value. So he, he distinguishes there, and it's an interesting point because here the Buddha is sort of seems to be advocating giving of alms. Um, I, I'd have to. That's what the English translation says, and that looks like what the, the Pali says. But it's, it's something to do with uh, giving, giving gifts to worldly people. It's much better because here he's slaughtering animals, which of course is actually unwholesome. But then he he goes on to say, "Pasana jitena mama sabaka nang wandanta nang to pay respect." To my disciples, the Buddha says. Hmm? Yeah, the the kusala jitana, the the wholesome mind that comes, is far more powerful. I mean, I think he's quite understating the truth here, uh, because honestly, sacrificing animals is not only a, a portion; it's not only a fraction. Uh, as good, it's actually harmful. There's nothing good about offering slaughtered animal, uh, slaughtering animals as an offering. So the, the Buddha is, I think, being a little bit e going a little bit easy on him, because probably if he if he were to say, "You're actually that's actually an unwholesome thing," then it would perhaps uh, set the guy off and make him upset at the Buddha. So he he couches it a bit nicer. He's, he he doesn't say how much less good it is than a quarter. Um, but it's uh, it's at least not it's, it's less than a quarter is good. It's actually harmful, and that's uh, true of many spiritual practices. So again, as I've talked about, um, we have to be aware of the true benefit of our spiritual practices. We can't just think I'm doing this and and uh, it's, you know this is what people tell me to do. This is spiritual, and therefore it's good. Spiritual practice can actually be harmful. You know, this was a spiritual practice that obviously was offering, killing animals in the name of God, that kind of thing. Sometimes we take people who have, have the idea that taking drugs is spiritual, and uh, I'm not going to go out and say that that's harmful, but my suspicion is that it has a great potential for harm, if not being outright harmful. I mean, I think a lot of people would say that taking even psychedelic drugs and hoping that it somehow is beneficial as a spiritual practice. Uh, I think people, some people would say that that is outright harmful. I'm not sure that I'd go quite so far, because there is an argument to be made that it opens up your mind to alternate states of reality. But I think there's a lot of delusion involved, like the idea that those states have some meaning or purpose or value, when in fact they're all messed up with delusion. And you know, I've been there, done that. And it's just a, it's just all a, it's a mess of our mind. You know what our mind can come up with when it's when it's doped up and it's uh, high. You know? So these kind of things, and uh, and and you compare that, for example, taking taking drugs as a spiritual practice to a Buddhist spiritual practice of like of giving charity or of even just holding your hands up and paying respect to someone who's worthy of respect. Why would, you know, who would think of that? It shows how far we, many, peop many people are from true spiritual practice. Many people say, oh, taking drugs, that's a spiritual practice, or um, you know, doing expansive rituals, or offering copious sacrifices, or this kind of thing. You know, doing very complex or very mystical things, maybe dancing, people say. In the West, we become very hedonistic with our spirituality, so... Maybe people say group orgies and karmic sex and that kind of thing. These are spiritual. Come contrast that to the Buddha's idea of what true spirituality is. Holding your hands up and paying respect. That is far more spiritual. It's so such a mundane seeming thing, but far more spiritual and far more beneficial. Even just for a moment than a hundred years of dancing, spiritual dancing or spiritual 
music or spiritual sex <laughs> drugs you know all these things so for someone looking for punya which we all are punya is goodness even if we're just set on meditation it's important not to become uh, self self centered you know in the sense of me 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 i want to become spiritually enlightened you know, enlightenment is about letting go sacrifice so it's a lot of self sacrifice an enlightened being will be able to give up anything if someone asks them for something they would have no sense of of self you know of of helping themselves they have no qualms there they consider what is proper to do and they do it without any attachment, without any greed. And they're very respectful. They honor those who have helped them. They're grateful to those who have helped them, that kind of thing. And they're very down to earth. So noble spirituality is like this. What's spiritual? Well, paying respect to those who are worthy of respect, giving gifts to those who are worthy of gifts, and mostly just being aware, being here, being present, being with mundane reality understanding truth, true reality, and not being concerned with mysticism or altered states of existence or that kind of thing. Astral travel, anyone who's obsessed with astral travel, I mean, it's not to say enlightened people can't practice it, but people who are striving for that are, are really missing the point. Mahasi Sayada tells a story of a woman who he knew who was working very hard to try and uh, see out of her ears. This was she was trying to gain the spiritual ability to see uh, out of her, e her ears. And he said, and this one, her eyes worked perfectly fine. So we get often on the wrong path. True spirituality is, heart is often easy to mistake for uh, ordinary reality. I always say that enlightened people are what we think we are. We all think of ourselves as living normally. We think of ourselves as normal. You know? But no, we're not. Our defilements take us away from what we think we are, take us away from mundane reality. So I've made much of this very simple verse, which uh, is very much like the other two verses, and I promise the next one is different. It's still, still along the same vein, but, it, but it's a totally different context and story, everything. And it's a very actually one of them probably the if not one of one of one of the if not the most famous verses in the Dhammapada coming up next uh, next time and then after that we have uh, the story of Sankicca which is a very nice story and so on and so on not all the stories are long some of them are very short as you can see some of them are very long uh, I think the longest ones have already gone by so we're not going to have great storytelling. Uh, not all of it is going to be great stories. But always something new and some new message to be found in the Dhammapada. And of course the verses themselves are things you can reflect upon. And what is important, this is the Sahasavagga, which is the thousands. So it's contrasting single things to thousands of things for the most part. Thousands of something useless, better is one thing that is useful. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, keep practicing and be well.